thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for this opportunity. Uh, let's jump into the first question. Um, uh, an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal a week ago uh, titled, Don't Expect Too Much Change with the Iranian Election. Um, what's your take on it? Uh, should people expect much change in the Iranian election result? I'm not sure that we should expect much change uh, in the election result. I think we should look at it from two standpoints, however. One is the role of the Iranian president, uh, and the other is who's likely to emerge as the Iranian president. Mm -hmm. So let me start with the latter first. I would guess that uh, when you try to predict Iranian elections, you should be very careful. We've had Hatami was a surprise, Ahmadinejad was a surprise, uh, Rouhani was a surprise. So there's a pattern here that even though the election process is skewed because you have a large number of people who want to be candidates and then the Guidance Council permits only a very small number. Mm -hmm. In this case, it was something like 1,600 who wanted to be candidates. Six were permitted to run. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a selection process that reduces the scope of the choice. Mm -hmm. Nonetheless, within the scope of that choice, we've seen constant surprises. Mm -hmm. So those who feel so confident predicting who's going to be elected, mm -hmm. if the history is a guide, they should they shouldn't they should have some humility and not be so confident mm -hmm. um, so we'll see but then there's the question of the role of the iranian president the iranian president doesn't fundamentally shape or run iran's policy towards the outside world mm -hmm. and certainly doesn't run iran's policy in the region rouhani was given the ability to deal with the sanctions issue he was given the ability therefore to shape the diplomacy vis-a-vis -vis the five plus one but he had almost no impact or influence on what Iran is doing in the region. It's the Quds forces of the Revolutionary Guard who have the principal mm -hmm. responsibility under the, the guidance and the leadership of the Supreme Leader. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking towards Iran's policy towards the outside world, it's not shaped by the Iranian president. The Iranian president does have an effect on domestic policy, and I think that's where the interplay of, of political forces plays out. U.S. military says that Iran has become more aggressive in the region uh, after the JCPOA deal uh, was enacted. Um, are you surprised? No. Uh, at the time, uh, before this was reached, uh, I, I said uh, the Supreme Leader has an ideology, and that ideology is shaped by fundamental hostility towards the United States. Now, he also has a perception of the U.S. Mm -hmm. His perception of the U.S. is that the U.S. is threatening and always determined to try to change the Islamic Republic, the regime. Mm -hmm. So that hostility, that, that ideology, that represents the underpinning of the, re underpinning of the regime. Mm -hmm. And once he did a deal with the United States and the other members of the 5 plus 1, he had, in my mind, he had to act in a way that would validate his ideology and his hostility towards the United States. And one of the ways to validate the ideology was to become more aggressive in the region. And we've seen the use of Shia militias uh, all throughout the region. Mm -hmm. This, I think, is in keeping with Iran's desire to dominate the region, mm -hmm. reflecting a judgment that they should. They're entitled to it, that they represent a kind of superior culture. Mm -hmm. So that's their view. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't surprised at all. Does this more assertive posture that you mentioned by, um, by Iran indicate they could also be providing increased support for their proxies like Hezbollah? And if so, um, would it be a violation of JCPOA, if not in the letter, but by spirit? We, we also can't have it both ways. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Obama administration said we're, we're not trying to change their behavior in the region. We, will, we recognize we have to deal with it but we're trying to deal only with the nuclear issue. Now, the Iranians took advantage of that. Mm. Uh, Arachi, who was you know, a deputy foreign minister, he, he's someone who was very clear that there's a, from the Iranian standpoint, they're free to do these things. Uh, that's because there was, no, there was never any linkage to the JCPOA. I mean, I have no problem identifying where I see Iran's destabilizing and aggressive behavior. I wouldn't say that what they're doing with the JCPOA represents somehow in the region represents some kind of violation of JCPOA because there was a kind of delinkage, a conscious delinkage on the part of the United States. You can raise questions about whether the Obama administration should have done that, mm -hmm. but that's a different issue. So I, they are more aggressive and assertive in the region, but I don't, and I say the JCPOA from, in some ways 
facilitated that because it did produce more resources for them. They can sell their oil. Mm -hmm. So uh, the short answer is I do think it facilitated it, but I don't think you can accuse the Iranians of somehow not living up to the agreement in its, in its terms or its spirit. Now, um, turning to um, um, Israel, um, Iran's nemesis. Yeah. Um, do you still believe or do you believe that as a deterrent, U.S. needs, U.S. military needs to supply Israel, yes, uh, the big heavy one, right. um, to destroy potential nuclear sites that could be buried deep in the mountains? My answer is yes. My answer is yes, because I think, I believe that with the JCPOA, there were some basic flaws. Mm -hmm. uh, and because after 15 years, the Iranians are not limited in terms of either the quality or the quantity of the nuclear infrastructure they can have, mm -hmm. I worry that the small gap between nuclear threshold status and weapons status might entice an Israeli and an Iranian leadership to believe that they could move quickly and confront the world with a fait accompli, a nuclear weapons fait accompli. I don't want the Iranians even to be tempted. I want to bolster deterrence. I want them to know if they violate the JCPOA, which where they say they won't seek, acquire, or pursue nuclear weapons, if they violate that, they can lose, in fact, they will lose their whole nuclear infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And if they don't believe the U.S. in terms of its declaratory policy on that, mm -hmm. providing the Israelis the mop and the means to deliver it sends a message to the Iranians that if, even if you doubt us, you won't doubt that the Israelis will act and you send a signal that the U.S. will support them when they do. That bolsters deterrence, that gives the Iranians a reason not even to be tempted to pursue a nuclear weapon, which I, my concern about the JCPOA is it leaves them in a position where they still have a nuclear weapons option. Okay, uh, providing Israel with the bomb and the means to deliver it, yeah. uh, wouldn't it play into the hands of Iranian hardliners? I don't think the, that you can make policy based on how you think the hardliners are gonna operate, the, pra the pragmatists. We had an Iranian position in the first term of the Obama administration, when I was in the Obama administration, where the Iranians said they wouldn't negotiate with us if, unless we lifted the sanctions. And we tripled down on the sanctions, and they negotiated with us. Because we were showing, unmistakably, the costs of their pursuing their nuclear program. Mm -hmm. And if they wanted those costs to be lifted, then they had to change their nuclear program. Mm -hmm. Now, I would say, you know, what matters here is that the Iranians understand there's a consequence if they're tempted to pursue mm -hmm. a weapon. I want to undercut mm -hmm. the ability of some within Iran to say, we can pursue a weapon and it won't cost us anything. And we can present the world with a fait accompli. I want it very clear, unmistakably. If you pursue that, you very likely will lose the entire investment you've made in your nuclear infrastructure. The point here is, not to invite a war, the point here is to ensure they don't have a nuclear weapon and that we bolster our deterrence. Mm -hmm. Fill in, in this case, one of the weaknesses, one of the vulnerabilities of the JCPOA. You, you ended with the JCPOA. With the JCPOA, many European companies uh, are rushing to make mega billion deals with right. Iran. But uh, there is a risk of investment will go further to embolden um, IRGC. Um, what's your take on it? Look. We hear constant complaints from within Iran that somehow we're not living up to the deal. Uh, and the fact is the U.S. has lived up to the deal. Mm -hmm. There are existing sanctions on human rights mm -hmm. uh, and on terrorism, mm -hmm. uh, including money laundering, mm -hmm. uh, that are still applied. Many European companies still look to the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, in some respect. And one of the points here is if the Iranians really want to invite investment in, and it's not entirely clear that the Supreme Leader wants it. The Supreme Leader always talks about wanting to be independent. Mm -hmm. He wants to develop without any uh, involvement from the outside world. Mm -hmm. And so some of the deals, by the way, in the oil area have been held up uh, without regard to the U.S., without any involvement of the U.S. But the issue here is if the Iranians want investment from the outside, then reform your banks. Then do what uh, the Financial Action Task Force, which is an international body, says you need to do to provide assurance that there isn't money laundering or there isn't money going for terrorist organizations. Mm -hmm. uh, until Iran does that, they will find that there will be more limitations on investment from the outside than would otherwise be the case. I think the IRGC was emboldened before. I think if they can acquire more money, they will they'll try to do more. Mm -hmm. 
Look, until there's a pushback on, on what they're doing, whether it's in Syria uh, or it's in Yemen or it's in Bahrain, mm -hmm. uh, you know, unless there's a pushback in the region where we and others can demonstrate there's a cost for using these Shia militias, mm -hmm. until, we, until we prove that, they're going to keep doing it because they're going to see an advantages to be gained. You mentioned the word again, cost. Um, so um, recently, um, as you mentioned regarding the cost, you also mentioned that there is a price for the Iranian that they should be aware of what Qasem Soleimani is doing in the region. Uh, how high is the price, do you think, and how Iranians would know about it? Well, it's hard to quantify it, but I think the point is that when the IRGC and the Quds forces are active using Shia militias, mm -hmm. they should see they don't gain, first of all. So there needs to be a kind of ability to contain. Secondly, they ought to see that uh, there's a cost, that they, they're, what they're investing is producing a disadvantage for Iran. We should be thinking about how you can do more sanctions. Uh, for example, what we're doing right now with Hezbollah, mm -hmm. Hezbollah is being more and more targeted in terms of its involvement with financial mm -hmm. networks. And the more we can shine a spotlight on that, the more we will prevent investment uh, the more it hurts Hezbollah. Well, the more these kinds of instruments like Hezbollah, which are proxies for Iran, mm -hmm. are used, and suddenly they find that it's costing them more, well, both they and the Iranians have to rethink some of their positions. Um, you mentioned Hezbollah as a Iran's proxy and the sanctions, uh, right. which is working. So uh, my next question is this. What's your position on designating the IRGC itself as a terrorist organization and start sanctioning it? We have designated instrumentalities of the IRGC. You know, the key to effective sanctions is to multilateralize them. Mm -hmm. If we take certain steps that basically others don't embrace, mm -hmm. then I think it's, you know, it becomes somewhat problematic. So I think you have to look, I would prefer to focus on specific companies where there is an I IRGC presence or IRGC ownership. I think if we do that, we're much more likely to be able to mobilize other support. If we simply try to blanket, if we simply say we're going after the IRGC per se, and the IRGC is seen as, uh, which it is, an arm of the regime, we'll face more resistance from others. So I think the right approach is to, to, have, is to focus like a laser on any company where there is an IRGC financial involvement or stake then I think we'll be more effective internationally. Okay, um, I'm taking this IRGC and my first question regarding Iran's election. What is the stake that IRGC has in the upcoming election? Well, clearly they've adopted a posture that it seems uh, hostile to Rouhani. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the biggest stake they have is they want to maintain the, <clears throat> the hold they have on the Iranian economy. Uh, and you know, to the extent to which they, they end up with a president who is trying to change the system, at least internally as it relates economically, the more they're going to resist it. So they will oppose any president who looks like that president is going after the, the financial structure of the, 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 of the country. Uh, um, and they have a, you know, they clearly dominate probably 30 percent of the Iranian economy. They may not, the truth is, they may not mind certain kinds of sanctions on Iran if it allows them to dominate even more of the economy. So the way we have to think about sanctions needs to be highly targeted. Ibrahim Raisi, uh, the cleric, um, uh, he's uh, backed by the IRGC. So if he loses this election, what will be his political future? Well, there obviously are some who also see him as a successor to the supreme leader. I think if he loses this election, it becomes harder, I think, for him to become a successor to the Supreme Leader. Would it be correct to assume that the current election result could influence the succession of the Supreme Leader, or is that a totally different ballgame? Totally ball no, I don't think it's a totally different ballgame. Uh, first of all, we know that Khamenei was a president before he became a Supreme Leader. Uh, just because you're president doesn't mean that you will become a Supreme Leader. Mm -hmm. But if you lose running for the presidency, that makes it harder, I think, to rationalize someone who has lost uh, than trying to, to give them, uh, anoint them as the Supreme Leader.